For those who are new to our venue, I'm Olaf Ruzhensky. I'm here on the behalf of Krakow Technology Park. Um, our next speaker does not need a special introduction. We all know his face. We all know what he has done. But before you give him a, put your heads together for him, uh, he made a special two videos just for you for today. Let's see this and have it a go. Have fun. Cheers. I'm Sam Lake. Sam Lake. I'm Sam Lake. I'm Sam Lake. I'm Sam Lake. Creative director from Remedy. Hello. In case you missed it, I'm Sam Lake from Remedy. Uh, really glad to be here. This is my first time in Poland and Krakow. Uh, but we really wanted to come here. You know, we know that there are a lot of Polish fans to our games. There are a few of us from Remedy here today. Tomorrow, Tato Alto is going to give a presentation on Northlight, Remedy's in-house engine and, and graphics programming. And Petri Alanko is going to do a presentation on music in Quantum Break. So, this presentation here is about stories and storytelling in, in Remedy games. I could happily spend the whole hour or the day talking about any single one of these stories. So this is going to be more on a high level, about recurring elements and, and unifying themes uh, in our stories, about use of different mediums in, in storytelling and, and about our character-centric stories and how we achieve it. But first, a couple of words about Remedy in general. Remedy was founded in 1995. We are based in Espoo in Finland, just outside Helsinki. And, uh, you know, back in 1995, we, we, our beginning goes back to the basement of the founders parents' house, so really in the beginning it started out as a garage band. Now in the past few weeks we've been in the news uh, uh, because uh, we, have, uh, we have done an IPO, which is our way to get more funds, to be more independent, uh, to be able to fund our own games on our own uh, and build for the future. These days, we have 140 people working at Remedy from 21 countries all around the world. People who come to work at Remedy obviously want to make games, the kind of games that we make. And, and 
speaking about this, we are hiring. So, you know, if you want to make games, uh, we have a booth uh, here. Come talk to us. Enough, the, enough of that. Let's go and, and, and talk about uh, our games and, and, and stories. You know, to this day, our story-driven cinematic action games have received more than 100 industry awards. We see ourselves as storytellers, and, and, and games are where we tell our stories. And they are very character-focused stories. Now, we draw inspiration from popular culture, uh, from all the different mediums. Not just games, obviously we are all gamers, uh, but, but you know, it feels natural for us to look what's happening all around uh, the entertainment industry and, and kind of things that excite us uh, are, are a good source of, of inspiration for us always. Something that's familiar and resonates with a lot of people, but still we make it unique, and obviously because these are games, we make it interactive. Uh, we want to create iconic characters. Uh, our bar has always been in linear media, you know, as high quality characters and, and stories as, as we can make. And because we make action games, the motives and conflicts of these characters are the springboard for action. Our games are set in present day real world, and by real I mean movie realism, you know, heightened, exaggerated, uh, and we always bring a layer of genre elements, and, and we love to explore different genres, be it, you know, pulp fiction or, or supernatural elements or science fiction. Now, going into pillars uh, of, of how we build these stories, uh, and, and the question is, you know, Within the action game framework, how do you create a character-centric story? Obviously, there are some problems there, because, you know, there is a lot of noise, a lot of explosions, a lot of shooting, and character, character can get lost very easily in that. So what's the solution? Make it all about character in every possible way. We, Usually we start with the name. I mean, the name of the game is the name of the character, is the theme of the story. And, and you know, it's, it comes down to the point of view uh, of the character. Uh, and, and it comes, voice of a narration is, is one tool that we use for this. It means that when you experience the game and the game world, you are not, ex you know, exactly experiencing the world itself, you are experiencing the version of the world that the character sees. It all goes through the point of view of the main character. And we use a lot of symbolism and metaphor, a lot of metaphors, uh, because the internal conflict of the character is the most important thing. And then the question is, how do you bring that internal conflict through symbolism into the external world and make the action game out of that. There are these best practices and, 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 and rules, uh, both in movies and in games, you know, show, don't tell, uh, and, and uh, play, don't show. And you could argue that narration, uh, as an example, is telling. Uh, but, you know, personally, I happen to like narration, even in movies. You know, Fight Club, for example, a great movie, great narration. Uh, and, and, you know, even in a game, if you still need to have the main character mumble out aloud things like, I need a key for this door, or, hmm, I can't use this yet, then maybe narration is much more stylized and sophisticated way of telling the player these things than having the character talk out loud. I think that good storytelling in games comes from many directions, many layers, many tools, and, and narration is, is one of them. It's a great way to get inside the head 
of the main character, show what's going on in there. It's a great way to set the tone and a voice of the experience and create a strong tone in it. And obviously, it does establish the point of view uh, in this. Now, <laughs> when it's about character, then obviously the themes need to be very personal to the character. For me, it has always been kind of the question, what is the most personal, up-close thing to a character? And to me, it's about family. And because this is an action game, there needs to be conflict and trauma, so it's about a broken family. And, and uh, you know, if you think about life from this perspective, everybody wants to be with their loved ones, but our hero ultimately is on this journey on his own. Now, jumping slightly to a different topic, I'll, I'll be going through our games one by one and talking about these things uh, in concrete terms, but, you know, through the history of Remedy Games, we've used different mediums as a storytelling tool. Max Payne, we used comic book. Alan Wake, we used a novel. Quantum Break, we now used a TV show. To me, it's been a logical journey in the sense that our games are set in present day. All of these different mediums play a role in our kind of fragmented lives. And, and, and with that, it just feels like a natural way of bringing these into the fictional world that we create. And, and I've always felt with games that, you know, you, you decide, you get to make your own rules in a way and, and, and kind of try different things out, uh, building them. A couple of words about the use of live action, as we'll go into that as well. You know, we've had, since Max Payne, we've had in-game television shows in our games. That was kind of the starting point, which evolved to actual live action content in Alan Wake when the technology got to that level. And, and, and then finally in Quantum Break, we actually had a live action TV show in there. So we'll, we'll come back to this. So, Max Payne. Uh, you know, obviously, Max Payne wasn't the beginning of Remedy. Death Rally was there, and it's important for the company. It's, it's important for me because I came to Remedy to write the text for Death, Death Rally. But then, you know, there wasn't a story in Death Rally. And afterwards, going into Max Payne, I wanted story. And there is a lot of story in Max Payne. So today, you know, going into this presentation, thinking back home, what would we do uh, for you guys to not just make this a boring PowerPoint presentation, make this entertainment. And, and we, we kind of thought that, you know, strip tease. That's, that's, that's the way to, you know, make this entertaining. Now everybody in the audience is going like, what the hell is he doing? Is he crazy? Yeah, that kind of goes with the territory. Uh, don't worry, don't worry. Thank you, Thomas. So, Max Payne. <laughs> Let's talk about Max Payne. Max Payne, uh, the inspiration for that came from crime stories, crime movies, essentially. Uh, and, and, you know, the story was structured with the movie three-act structure. Film noir especially has always been something special for me. I wanted to bring that uh, in, into this uh, experience. You know, there is a flashback structure uh, in the game. It starts from the end and, and then goes to the beginning and we'll see how he got to this situation. Very film noir thing. Also, you know, if you think about Max as a character, he is this classic private eye cranked up to the max, pun intended. Uh, and, and 
it, that's a kind of a character who it gets beaten a lot, falls down, but always climbs back up uh, and, and never gives up. A stubborn guy. And that's a big part of, of what makes him uh, a hero. Also, you know, with the tragedy there, he's driven by guilt. That's, to me, in these stories, guilt is a strong, strong motivation. You could say that this comes from, you know, Finnish Lutheran background. Guilt is a big thing. And, 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 and stubbornness is, is very much a Finnish thing uh, as well. So, as a genre convention, hard-boiled narration just fit in very well. And, and as I mentioned earlier, you know, I was worried going into Max Payne that, that there is so much gunplay and so much action. How do I get the story and the character to be heard? And my solution was, well, it needs to be all caps. It needs to be, you know, metaphor after metaphor, you know, shouting about the story in, 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 in some ways. And, and everything is on a symbolic level, you know, about extremes, heaven and hell and gods and angels and monsters. Uh, and that's how the, sto uh, you know, the style was born in it. Uh, Obviously, the theme of broken family, in Max's case, sadly, it's a, it's a dead family. Uh, and, and because of that, the, the darkness inside, the internal conflict, uh, you know, it's, it's really extreme. And, and, and then how to bring that to the world around him it's always nighttime in, in Max's New York. It's, there, there is the worst winter storm in a century. So it's not really real world. It's, it's Max's way of seeing New York. It's, it's noir York. Uh, the other great way of, of bringing the internal to external and building levels out of that, obviously, are the dream sequences. So I'll talk about the comic books. Uh, in a bit, but this is obviously also about hardboiled narration. Let's look at some of that. I woke up in a bad dream. My head felt two sizes too small for my brain. Max Payne, I envy your name. And the killer was smiling. Pleased to meet you. I'm Frankie to bat Niagara. Niagara, as in you cry a lot? He had a baseball bat and I was tied to a chair. Pissing him off was the smart thing to do. Nothing wrong with a little laugh now and then. Take me, for example. I love to watch cartoons. Cartoon violence is a fascinating thing. Let's take a break. I need to take a leak and maybe grab a cold one at the bar. Don't worry. I'll be back to finish this off. And then, it's checkout time. You play, you pay, you bastard. He swaggered out, and the door clanged shut behind him, locks clicking into place. So, you know, we went with a, a graphic novel or comic book uh, for, for storytelling. First of all, I'm a big fan of comic books, and that played a role in it. But also, if you go back to 95, 96, 97, and look at the cutscenes in the games back then, they were not much. Uh, and and to tell a deeper story, to tell more story, that really wasn't an option. And, and, and with, with a comic book, you could actually, actually do that. Also, you know, if you think about this exaggerated style of narration, comic books in, in, in themselves are kind of exaggerated. So, so that felt, felt like a good fit. And, and, and finally, if you look at comic books, they are always very character-centric. So, so that was a match as well. The other thing uh, that we used or, or started using here, uh, just a small thing in the first Max Payne, but it keeps growing bigger, were the in-game TV shows. Uh, the first one was Address Unknown. Uh, 
with this idea of, of kind of this psychological thriller, if you will, uh, of the dark side of the main character uh, becoming real. Uh, and, and, and to me that kind of is an echo and a twisted mirror to Max's own story, and the dark side obviously is kind of his guilt. Uh, the other thing that we did here for the first time is kind of blurring the line between these different layers. We have the TV show in the world, we have the actual world of the game, but they start to kind of uh, merge in the sense that Address Unknown is a well-known TV show in, in Max's world, and, and the chunkies uh, in this world are, are kind of mumbling and repeating certain catchphrases from the show, like the flesh of fallen angels, and that gets a deeper, more symbolic meaning. Let's look at the Address Unknown episode. This is actually... The poet Poole, in his poem, Somebody's Been Wearing My Face Again, wrote, In this hall of mirrors... Hey, we were watching that, asshole. ...made pale reflection of myself. I had escaped from the Pink Bird Mental Institute. I was lost in Noir, York City. I couldn't find my way back home. John Mira had made me a killer. Well, the dreams I already mentioned. It's, it's a good question whether that's kind of internal becoming external or vice versa. It doesn't really matter. Uh, dream logic is a great way to bring symbolism uh, into the experience and obviously getting inside the character's head and also in some ways having fun. Uh, Maybe it's a kind of a bit of a postmodern thing, but I, I, I do love kind of playing games with our game story. Uh, moving on to Max Payne 2 then. Many of the same elements, obviously, in Max Payne 2. Uh, comic book, narration. What I wanted to do with Max Payne 2 was make it even more film noir. Uh, there is a flashback structure but it's even more kind of complex flashback. The, the, the tone of narration was refined and, and the themes, you know, and, and it all comes back, back to the fact that there are no happy endings in film noir. There is the idea of a broken family once again. It's kind of a love story that is doomed to fail. Doomed to fail unless you play through the game on all difficulty levels three times when you do get the happy ending, but that's also the fun part of making something interactive. Uh, and we brought in a lot more in-game television shows from different genres. They are all reflections of, of Max's story. The question is, are they really, or is it just in his head that how he sees in the uh, how he sees the world around him, and everything kind of feels that that it's up commenting him uh, in a way, and blurring the lines between the worlds. Now, address unknown is an actual game level, a fun house game level where Mona is staying that you visit several times, and Vinnie Gognitti, one of the mobsters, turns out to be a huge Captain Baseball Bat Boy fan. And, and you actually find him uh, in a cosplay suit uh, of the character, which becomes a story element as well. You know, one additional storytelling element that I have not mentioned yet is music. And, and in Max Payne 2, for the first time, we brought in music as an element. And we keep driving into the night It's a late goodbye such a late goodbye And we keep driving into the night It's a late goodbye Hey! Hey! NYPD, I need the code at the seventh floor door. Yeah, so music as a storytelling tool. Uh, we created Late Goodbye with the band Poets of the Fall, they are friends, um, and, and it's a hit song in the world, as you could see. So once again, we, we are kind of uh, blurring the line between these elements, and the lyrics are thematically tied to the story. That's, that was the starting point. In Alan Wake, we uh, went quite a bit further with this. Talking about Alan Wake, 
And actually, with Alan Wake, I think that there is a time for a costume change. This is a hot leather jacket, good for a winter storm, but... but uh, Thank you, Thomas. Uh, and as, as you can see, Ilkka Villi, the brilliant actor of Alan Wake, is a bigger man than I am. Uh, Alan Wake. My name is Alan Wake. I'm a writer. I came to Bright Falls with my wife, Alice. I told myself I could rest here, sleep here, and forget about my work. I thought we could be happy here. It's a psychological thriller or a supernatural thriller, or both. That's kind of an open question, and that's kind of a part of a team to, to you know, think about that. Uh, funnily enough, Alan Wake was, in part, inspired by Address and Known, another psychological thriller. Uh, obviously inspired by Twin Peaks and David Lynch movies and, and, and Stephen King's writing, but also Address and Known. Now, we brought in the TV show structure, a season of a TV series. That was a step away from Max Payne's movie structure. And still to this day, I feel that this fits a game really, really well. Uh, you know, and, and coming a full circle, which kind of shows how these, our, our games interact with each other. Alan Wake, obviously, being a writer, he, he wrote crime novels with a hard-boiled cop. Sounds, sounds familiar. Uh, you know, the question is, the idea of making the internal conflict external action, the question with Alan Wake was, how concrete can you make that? And in Alan Wake, we have fiction becoming real. Our main character is a writer. His fiction is about his inner demons and... and and, you know, it's all about his, the dark depths of his subconscious mind uh, then turning into darkness, escaping from, the, uh, from Cauldron Lake. There is the theme of broken family once again. His marriage is in trouble. It's a lot to do with his inner demons. Uh, and, and once again, guilt is a strong motivator uh, for him to fix things. Uh, the storytelling tool is a novel or a manuscript of a novel. Um, and, and, and narrator is the storyteller here. Uh, and, and it's not just about the pages of the manuscript you, you find. Actually, with his narration, the whole thing you are playing, it's all the novel. You, know? you are playing this story that has come true. Once again, we use in-game televisions. Uh, Let's take a look at, at some of that. Anything outside of riding is a struggle. I feel ill. I managed to make my way downstairs. There's a shoebox filled with books and papers by Thomas Zane. It's very hard to focus, but I managed to read some of it. He's a poet, and a good one. He writes of muses and creators summoning fabulous things from a magic lake using his powers to shape the world of a realm of gods and dreams and demons, dark things that wait for a chance to slip through, wearing the flesh of men as disguise. Zane writes about himself, his girlfriend being taken over by a dark presence. 
about growing scared of the lake. Zane believes it's a mirror to the gaping void of darkness above, where some Lovecraftian presence lurks. Yeah, so we brought in live action because the technology at this point allowed it. Uh, right there in the cabin uh, was one show. It's not exactly a TV show. It's, it's more like a manifestation of Wake's lost memories. But then there was Night Springs, which is inspired by the Twilight Zone. And, and we play around with variations of the theme uh, of the game in, in kind of many different uh, ways. The funny thing is, of course, that Wake used to write for this show, so it's one more thing of his fiction kind of bleeding into reality. Uh, and the blurring of the lines once again. The game starts with a dream sequence where Wake is on his way to Night Springs. Uh, and obviously, Pride Falls, our real location, is in some ways very close to uh, Night Springs, which is kind of very obvious way of, of symbolism there. This one thing Night Springs. did not happen here. You're insane, Colvin. Insane? Insane? Hey, was this thing supposed to be plugged in? I stumbled on it. You fools! Gaze upon quantum immortality! Poor, poor Dr. Colvin. Filled by his own hubris or the ignorance of the masses. Perhaps he should have left the crate unopened, the decaying atom unobserved. Curiosity often kills the cat in Night Springs. More about music, uh, which we did regarding the story a lot more in, in Alan Wake. Uh, Poets of the Fall came back, but they assumed the role of a fictional band in, in Alan Wake's world called Old Gods of Asgard. There are these two senile old men, uh, NPCs in the story, Odin and Tour Anderson, who used to have a rock band in 60s and 70s, who are now just totally crazy, or old Viking gods, depending on who you ask. Uh, poets created two songs uh, for the band, and both play an important plot role uh, in, in the game. Let's look a bit about the, the Anderson brothers in action. I'd like to bash his head in with a hammer. Oh, he'd love to fish out our secrets, but he has no clue. He's not crazy enough. <laughs> not crazy like us, Sonny. Yeah! Being crazy is a requirement, Sonny. Who else? could understand the world when it's like this. It takes crazy to know crazy. That's the sanest thing I've heard in a while. <laughs> Say, you're all right, Tom. Hey, we like him, don't we, bro? He's got to go to the farm. The Anderson Farm. Valhalla. We wrote it all down, lest we to forget. A crash course. All you need to know to get your head right. You need to find the message. Here, Sonny, here's something for you. Gave me a rash, but I kept it safe from these bastards. Of Oscar. And now moving on to Alan Wake's American Nightmare. Uh, we stylized the whole experience as an episode of Night Springs written by uh, Alan Wake. Uh, and, and because of that, it made sense to have more live action, actually in cutscenes. It's a TV show. Uh, we brought in the team of uh, The Dark Side Made Concrete in, in Mr. Scratch, which obviously owes 
a lot to uh, address unknown. Uh, and, and John Mira character there, uh, Mr. Scratch is already introduced in the uh, original game. There is the theme of broken family. Uh, he, he kind of manages to defeat his dark side and, and uh, save his marriage, although is that a bit too good to be true and, and, and maybe feels a bit dreamlike. Your, your interpretation is as good as mine. Uh, the structure actually was a time loop. Guess which game comes after this. But first, let's look a bit of, of Ilka Willi in the role of Mr. Scratch. You knew I'm a psycho. I told you I'm a psycho. Really? This is just for kicks. It's a fun role for an actor. Quantum Break. I'll disappoint you. Uh, we don't have Jack's outfit with us today, uh, but actually the shirt I was wearing is, is quite close, close enough uh, for, for now. Uh, let's look at the trailer. The number one killer is time. It will get us all. What do you want to know? How I gained superpowers? How time broke? A growing fracture in time leading to the end of time? How we traveled back to fix it and failed horribly? How it all went to shit? What do you want to know? Going to break, we set out to do our version of Hollywood's summer blockbuster sci-fi spectacle in the form of a game. Uh, it's about time travel. Uh, what's different is that Quantum Break is, has an ensemble cast. Obviously, the name is a clue. It's not the name of the character. Although for Jack Joyce, we kind of went in with the same name creation principles as before. Once again, looking for logical flow, it's actually inspired by a Night Springs episode called Quantum Suicide that you saw a clip earlier. Obviously inspired by all the time travel movies, big science fiction spectacles uh, as well. Now, what we had in the game was game and a live action show, game graphics and, and a live action show side by side, which in a nice way pushed us to work on our character technology uh, to, to make it as good as we could and, and create digital doubles of the actors. Uh, let's look at the characters just a bit in this scene. You don't understand the power you're wielding. You need to hand this technology over to Monarch. I've prepared for what happens next. You say you're prepared, but no part of this plan of yours involves stopping it from happening. Even if I fix William's machine, what could you possibly hope to achieve? The end of time is coming. There's no way to- Hey! This isn't a debate. I just watched a ship fast forward through a fucking bridge. Time is running out. And the fracture's getting worse by the minute. And it cannot be stopped. Paul has been to the end of time. He's witnessed it firsthand. Can't you see? We prepared for what's next out of necessity. Your research is based on work by William Joyce. You respected him. He knew that the fracture would occur, but he also knew that it could be fixed. Will built a way to stop the fracture. This. The countermeasure. 
We're traveling to the past to retrieve it. You can help us get there faster. So, these are not the digital doubles, these are the real guys, our leading men. Uh, Sean Asmore, Dominic Monaghan, and, and Aidan Gillen on a break, uh, prepping their lines in a, in a mock up shoot in LA. Uh, we had narration here. Uh, this time it's Jack's interview. He is being interviewed in the enemy base. Uh, and, and then we have scenes where you play the bad guy, Paul Serene, and, and he's, he narrates his own scenes, which, where he is kind of um, uh, recording uh, a memo. Once again, it's a broken family. Uh, Jack is there to save the only family he has, his brother. And, and he's opposed by his surrogate family, his best friend, turned his mortal enemy, uh, Paul Serene. Guilt plays a big role. Uh, if I could only go back in time and change things, uh, undo mistakes. And our hero, once again, is a stubborn guy. Uh, everybody says that it can't be done. Turns out, and this is a spoiler, sorry, it can't be done because it's a closed loop. Uh, but by trying to do it, he actually learns how to fix things in the present. Uh, we have two mediums. We have the show and, 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 and the game. And, and we needed to figure out good roles for them. So, so the game is the hero's journey. The show is all about the villains. As many modern TV shows are kind of questionable characters, and the clue that binds them together in between are these scenes that we call junctions in time, where you play Paul Serene and, and you make choices that affect both the game and the show. Let's look a bit of the show. I've been to the past. I've tried to change things. Undo mistakes. Only to find there's no changing the inevitable. Time is just one closed loop. No matter what I do, you and I, we always end up here. No matter what I do, time ends. In everything you've seen, do I stop before you're dead? And he stops. Uh, coming a full circle, having fun with these things. Uh, obviously, in Quantum Break's world, thank you, thank you. Uh, Quantum Break's world, uh, you can find Alan Wake's books, and, and at the university, you can find an analysis of his stories on a, on a chalkboard, and we created a trailer of an Alan Wake TV show. Here we have two FBI agents looking for the missing rider. They are not making very good progress, are they? Unfortunately. Uh, I'm almost at the end. So, you know, the character's point of view uh, is a very important thing. But it is built from, from many different directions. There are many layers to it. Uh, many, many different mediums and, and pieces. This might seem like it makes it fragmented and weaker, but, but you know, our, our lives, everyday lives are very fragmented, I feel. And, and, and to me, that makes it deeper and, 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 and more real. You know, having these echoes, having these layers, having these twisted mirrors, I feel, leave room for interpretation. And, and they, you know, that leads to mystery which is always cool, that leads to discovery, and through that we feel strong emotions, as I feel art should strive for, to, to create strong emotions. i leave you with this sentence. That to me kind of is, is very true. Shortly about the future, Remedy has grown a lot. Uh, we have moved into multi-track studio. We have two game projects 
uh, being worked on at the same time, which means more games more often. Uh, we are working with Smilegate, uh, a Korean uh, games company. Or, uh, we are working on a story mode for their upcoming Crossfire 2, which is very much a remedy game, but once more in a new genre, exploring different genres. And then there is P7, the, you know, just a code name, Mysterious Project 7. Uh, I would love to talk more about that. I can't. Thomas would uh, shoot dodge me down. Uh, all I can say is really, really excited to be working on it uh, and, and, and writing it. As said, you know, we are hiring. Come work with us on these games. Uh, right after this, I have a meet and greet session uh, in the press area. Uh, we can kind of move the Q&A there, come say hi, come talk, uh, and, and enjoy the rest of uh, Digital Dragons. Thank you, thank you. You have been a lovely audience. <laughs>